Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I'm Dr. Anna, and we're going to work together today with the research project. Last week, we discussed how to write a research project, the elements that should be included in a research project, how to write the introduction. In fact, before the introduction, how to plan your research and then get started. Today, we're going to talk about the four research projects available in your Moodle. So here we go. The first one, of course, if you're not doing English, if you're doing a different language, you will adapt it to the other, to, to, let's suppose if you're doing for Spanish or for Arabic, you will adapt to your paper for your context. If you have any questions, please contact Dr. Siavash that he'll certainly adjust and guide you in what needs to be done. So the first proposal of research project you will find these proposals all in Moodle. It's all there. You will describe in eight to 10 pages preferred methods used to teach English to children in English speaking families born and raised in a Korean, Arabic, or Chinese, or Spanish speaking country. So you're going to focus majorly in terms of resources, you're going to focus in primary classrooms. Okay, because it's teaching English to children of English speaking families that are born and raised in another country that is not their country that speaks English as a first language. So that's the context that you will be dealing with here. So once again, you will focus your resources and your research on primary classroom. The second proposal. It says, describe the best method to teach English to non-native English speakers living in a Korean or Chinese or Arabic speaking environment, for example, in Dubai. Compare this with non-native English students residing in the, in the US, for instance. So concentrate on business English language and the common daily expressions such as TOEIC rather than academic language. TOEIC is a test of English for international communication. It's much more business-like than the TOEFL or, for example, IELTS, okay? So in this research project, we are trying to compare the same, the same learning group, people who don't speak English as their mother tongue, in two different environments and evaluate methods used and results achieved. Advantages and disadvantages along with methodologies that suit best in either condition. So here you can focus, for example, on comparative research design in language learning. Now, this type of research project, it will require a lot of reading and becoming aware of methods that are used, for instance, teaching students English in a non-native English speaking country and teaching foreign students in an English speaking country because then it changes. The perspectives change because the usage of language also changes. The third proposal, just shift the screen here. It is to elaborate on the formation of English foundation as primary learning levels to a foreign speaker that intends to learn writing and reading in English for academic reasons, geographically located in a country such as China, or Egypt, where the first language is not English. This is for academic learning, such as TOEFL, IELTS, university entrance exams for, 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 for adults, sorry. So here you can focus on doing your research with language teaching and language testing, a way and ways to make appropriate connections. So this is one option. You can focus on strategies to teach reading, for example, for uh, an academic test, the skimming and scanning process, which are also, which are very helpful. Remember that the research project, you shouldn't extend it too much. So that's why you need to narrow it down. When I said, focus on reading, let's suppose for IELTS, that's an option because you, you won't be able to cover all four skills in a research project. So these are, this is the third proposal. Now comes the fourth proposal. Elaborate on teaching English as a second language in Canada to immigrants and international students 
compare the LINK program introduced by the federal go government to other, we will compare the LINK program to other immersion and intensive programs used in language schools or colleges across Canada. You can provide suggestions on improving the LINK and outline its advantages or disadvantages to other programs available in Canada. So there's a little misspelling here in the second link. Link is with a C, in fact. And these are two very useful links if you decide. This type of project, if you are living in Canada and tend to teach English in Canada, this project is really interesting because you become fam familiar of what is available in terms of at the government level. And of course, you will compare the proposal of the government with other English schools of immersion and intensive programs used in language schools or colleges across Canada. This is a very documental research because it's not really hands-on. You don't go to the to field to see how any method is being applied. So it's very documental and it involves a lot of theory. Okay. And then you have what is the language instruction for newcomers in Canada in the LINK program? So these two links, they're very helpful. I'm going to share these two links. Well, the, the presentation will be shared, but I will also share these two links with you right now in the chat box. Bear with me just one little minute. So here's the chat box. There we go. So you have this there. So now, if you wish, you can do this research and suddenly you may be interested in developing this topic. Okay. So these are now when you're going to work with your research project. Be sure that you, you're careful with plagiarism. Plagiarism can, you can fail the project if plagiarism is identified in your project. And it's very easy to avoid plagiarism. Cite, cite the references, cite the author. In fact, I always tell students that citing authors and references in a project shows that you have done your research. So don't avoid them and don't say, don't use other people's uh, or other writers and authors, you know, information as if it were your own. So share the source of inspiration by citing the authors. Um, usually when a teacher reviews a document uh, or a project, we always run it through the plagiarism checker. There are several plagiarism checkers, so we always check that. So to avoid any kind of embarrassment, you don't need to, 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 to do, you don't need to, to copy and not cite. You should copy and cite. Once again, it will show that you have done your job as a researcher. You've gone through the references, you've checked, you've, you've done your reading. And from the reading that you have done, you have extracted the information that is relevant to support your research. Okay, so that's the key here. Very well, now we're going to move on to the next topic that is TBE today. Bear with me just one little minute. I'm going to share the video. So moving on now, here we go. So 
TB this content there is a lot of additional content of course in your in, in Moodle I'm going to discuss and present an overview of TB but in order for you to become more knowledgeable you you should access this information watch the videos so the TB course outline is introduction to writing and disciplines writing and literature and creative writing science and technology social sciences professional writing and statements of purpose so tb is teaching business english but not with that concept of business english only thinking of an office okay it goes beyond that and we're going to understand the concept so tb in fact means writing in other disciplines because business my business is teaching english but another person's business can be teaching history so that's the business that's why we talk about other disciplines and that's why it's called teaching business english because the business depends upon who and what is your field so it's not only that concept of administration or in an office it covers much more than that so what's a discipline so an academic discipline is also called a field or area of study in higher education, such as colleges and universities, most students will choose a discipline to pursue in their studies. So they will choose a discipline and then they will attend subjects. So you choose a discipline and then the classes in order for you to graduate, you will attend several subjects. So these disciplines arise out of centuries of histories and ways of education. In fact, there's no formal way of defining what is a discipline or not. Sometimes it, it can be some disciplines are commonly known and are found in nearly every university. But now with, remember that we're going through a lot of change, principally with, with technology and due to technology. There are many disciplines that are, 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 are just, you know, new. They, they're not yet maybe a discipline in the traditional concept of discipline, but in fact, in practice, they are, okay? So take, for example, uh, areas of web design and so on. So this is all very new, the need of developing any kind of information and, and uh, resources on using technology. And now you have IoT, for example. So IoT, is it a discipline or not? Well, we're not sure, but we do use IoT for all of this integration of, of devices. So it can be a discipline, right? So for example, most colleges or university will allow pursue a study of mathematics, biology, history. Within a dis discipline are also sub-disciplines. So for example, Within history, a student might focus only on Russian history or within biology, only like plant biology. So once again, you have sub-disciplines. The intention of this explanation is for you, once again, to understand that teaching business English is not only that concept of office, of administration. So let's look at these three examples. You probably will, not, you will identify them without being told what they are. And what makes them different from an so but what makes them different that's what we need to identify so the first one our first example i will give you a few minutes for you to read it and then we're going to discuss we're going to see the three examples while you're reading try to identify signal words markers specific vocabulary that you identify okay so here we go Two little minutes for you guys to read, and then we will be back to move on. I will move from one screen to another.
So by reading this passage, are you able to identify what is the discipline? That's your job now. Let's go to the next one. Okay, once again, based on the information that you see, that you read, sorry, can you identify the, the discipline? There's one more. Okay, so here we go. This one too, I'm sure that you probably identified the field. Even if you don't understand what these samples of writing say, you can notice some differences. For instance, the last one, the last one, the first one is within our field, I believe. So there are quotations and we say that this, this one then is from history. There's a lot of information. You have quotation marks, you have references. So five and six, these are the references in the sources. So this is from history. So the discipline is history. Here we can see, of course, some literature. The name of a, of a, of a literature writer and then poem, the word poem. So it's a literary device, themes. There are many words that guide us to understand that this comes from literature. And then this one, it comes from medicine. And some of the words I can barely pronounce. I had to practice a bunch. Check the pronunciation dictionary to be sure because they are very sensitization. It's a hard word to say. So this is from medicine. So although there may be some differences in writing expectation between disciplines, the academic writers in all fields need to write clear, concise, and grammatically correct sentences. Of course, remember punctuation and above all, critical thought. You can't just copy what is being said by other writers and authors or reports. You have to use that information, analyze it, and correlate what authors say and how the information that these authors bring to you will contribute in your project or in the writing, in your article, and anything that you're writing has to have this, in, the influence has to be identified by the writer. So you, let's suppose you read a reference and that reference supports your line of thought. You're going to explain why, what are the characteristics that are similar that support, okay? So in order for you to do a good job, 
writing and, and teaching TB, you need to determine what you need. You need to have use sticky papers, even if you want, you know, those post-it notes. If you're doing it online, if you're, if you prefer to do it in digital, be sure that you know how to use all of the resources in order to do your highlighting and your, your notes. In order for you to identify the area, the discipline of any reading passage, you're going to start to read the first paragraph in order to identify the main idea of, the, of, the, of that paragraph. So most likely you will find a, a sentence or passage that tells what it is about. Highlight it and continue doing the same for all the paragraphs of the reading. So a reading passage commonly has an introductory paragraph with the main idea. So the main idea is informed in the introductory paragraph. Each paragraph below will develop a main idea that refers back to the main topic. So that's why a good piece of writing, when you plan, you have a main topic and how you're going to develop and describe that main topic. And then each element will be in one part in, in separate paragraphs. So if you're going to discuss, let's suppose, teaching methodology, or as a uh, te teaching foreign language methodology. So there are six, you're, you're going to discuss out of six, two methodologies. So that's what you inform in your introduction. And then you discuss the first one in the first paragraph and what element you will discuss in that paragraph has to be informed in the topic sentence of the paragraph. If you're going to add, let's suppose you're discussing the audiolingual method and you're going to, to the four main characteristics. So the first paragraph you define that the audiolingual method will be discussed and the first point, and then you discuss the first point. In the second paragraph, you relate back to the audiolingual and say, now the second point will be discussed in, in the audiolingual method. So that's why it's going to sound coherent. In the introduction paragraph is where you cited or you mentioned that two methods will be discussed, okay? Read over, so when we're reading, so let's suppose now you're reading for references. You're going to read over your highlighted areas. You can do this with a pencil, a highlighter. Some people don't like to highlight books. I love to highlight my books because that's how I identify the information that I need. Now, if you're using a digital document nowadays, most of us, we use a lot of digital documents due to the variety of reliable uh, libraries online. There are many resources that you can use also, even on PDF documents. You can highlight, you can add notes. You have to find any other important ideas in the reading, such as repeated and keywords. Now, why? So, let's suppose it's teaching methodologies, and then you're going to be discussing the audiolingual method. And you're going to repeat audiolingual a couple of times. Every time you repeat, or you read a repetition, it's because a concept is being built around that idea. So that's why repeated words, they are key words, because every time you see that word in a text, it's because a concept is being built based on that keyword. So audiolingual, let's suppose you will see it several times in a reading passage that discusses audiolingual, but each time it is mentioned, it's because a concept is being built around it. Whenever you're reading for information to identify the information that you need, remember one paragraph will be linked to the other. And it's always important that you keep track of what is the main idea of each paragraph. Each paragraph has one main idea. And this main idea refers back to the main topic. Now, if you are the writer, as a writer, this is what you have to develop. In order to develop, you need to plan. Planning is crucial. Remember always to, to take notes of your, 
bibliography that you're using because you will need to go back and consult. Sometimes you're making a direct citation, so you need the number of the page. Copy exactly the name of the author. If you're copying a direct citation, be sure that, you, be sure that your spelling is correct, your punctuation. Now, in TV, we're going to discuss short stories and understanding fiction. So this is another discipline, another area that we're going to. Now, why should you read fiction? Or why should our students read fiction? Why should we teach fiction? So the, the question, why should you read fiction, is in the sense, why should our student read fiction? Well, in today's busy world, principally if you're dealing with, with adults, many people feel that reading fiction is a waste of time, that it's much more important to follow the news to be updated or to read nonfiction because then you can get information and knowledge. So there is this belief. However, the following article explains the benefits of reading fiction. If you don't understand some of the vocabulary, make a note of the words and then you can look them up, but that won't impede your understanding. Think about the ideas, then discuss your thoughts. Here we go. So that's, sorry, this is an activity that you have there in Moodle. Now, your brain, when dealing with fiction, with all the noise from our digital devices, the old fashioned, good old book seems to be out of style now. However, in particular novels, which are fiction, they do have a very valuable contribution when it comes to creativity, because these are the pieces of writing that use creativity and that will, will trigger also you to use your creativity because the descriptions in novels, you, you have to imagine the scenario. The description is given, but it's your creativity who's going to, to make it come to life. So, in a research, brain scans show what happens when we read a detailed description, a metaphor or an emotional discussion between characters. So, the stories the research show stimulate the brain and even change how we behave in our own lives. It's true. So, this is scientific research, science fi uh, fiction, not science fiction, not science fiction, fiction, novels in particular, they trigger our creativity and our imagination, and this stimulates the brain, and it can even influence how we act. So researchers have known for many decades that there are certain parts of the brain involved in understanding and interpreting a, a, a passage or, or written words. However, recently, Research has discovered how stories activate other parts of the brain that were unknown. Due to the advancement of technology of the brain scans, more detail can be observed. So when we read words like roses, perfume, and skunks, for example, the language processing of our brains, it responds. So of course, you're not going to read the word skunk without having some kind of reaction. And this reaction is shown in our brain in a brain scan. So it triggers differently, it stimulates the brain differently. That's why we teach fiction to, to our students. And I'm trying to show this because many times, once again, we're so concerned about being updated and um, about teaching um, updated information or updated topics that we forget the value of novels. Many years ago when we were teaching English, the most common way of teaching English was not using novels as authentic material, because novels, they are authentic material, just as an article from a newspaper and so on. But, you know, the idea of retrieving novels as a source of teaching. While, while the students read, the brains, uh, 
they have a different way of functioning. In this research, in Spain, they asked the participants to read words with strong odor association, along with neutral words. So it was a, a mix of words. While they read, their brains were scanned by a functional magnetic resonance imaging. It's a much more sophisticated equipment machine. When subjects looked at words such as perfume and coffee, the part of the brain responsible for sensing smells lit up, or that means stimulated. When they saw words like chair and key, this region was dark. So how do we trigger creativity? By reading, that's definitely one way. And reading, not this information only, but reading novel where descriptions. Now, aside from that, there are several figures of speech that are used in novels that you won't find in information articles, such as I said, newspapers and academic writing. Once again, identifying this irony, it will challenge your student and yourself even if you decide to read. When no, so verbal irony, is one of the strategies that is that is used. So when a word's intended meaning is different from the actual meaning, for example, imagine it's a stormy day and a character says, what beautiful weather. Another way a writer might use irony is in naming a character. A character in a story is always sad or angry. The author names the character happy. So this is what is called a verbal irony. It's when you say a word, but not really with that meaning, right? So it's raining outside, oh my God, that's beautiful weather, right? Like, not at all, but it's a way of being, of expressing irony. Situational irony is when a situation ends differently than what is expected, or what would be normal, at least. So we, we call this situational irony. So for example, in The Gift of the Maggie, it's a story by O. Henry, the husband and wife each sell a prized possession to buy the other a gift. So look how interesting this is. The husband sells his, his watch to buy his wife some beautiful hair cups, and the wife cuts and sells her hair to buy her husband a watch chain. So can you imagine? That's not expected, right? So these are, but can you imagine while reading how this stimulates your brain? Because it's unexpected, so it makes you think again and once again, even change the way we act. This link is really nice. It's determining whether something is ironic or not. It's not easy. And in this link, you can vote. I'm going to share with you and you can see other people's votes. It's, it's really intriguing, quite curious, and once again, stimulating. So this is the link. Take a look there afterwards, then you'll tell me what you think about it. Here we go. So we're back now. So thank you so much for joining me today. So we discussed in this session the four different projects proposed in your in Moodle. It's time for you to start thinking what areas, which project you believe is will be better for you to develop. Once again, always start with a plan. Think about realistically what can you achieve don't don't bite more than you can chew sometimes something more narrowed down and less content but research done in depth can be you can get a better result than trying to make a big research without narrowing down your your specific topic once again thank you so much for joining me and i'll see you guys next week 
Take care now. Bye.